So I became interested in evolution when I was about 17. I didn't think that I would ever be a biologist or anything like that. I liked philosophy very much and I read quite a lot of philosophy and I liked Arthur Kessler too. And I read The Ghost in the Machine and in The Ghost of the Machine he was talking about, uh, psych uh, about uh, behaviorism and about uh, genetics and about development and the relationship between development and genetics and uh, Darwinism. He also introduced me to Waddington and I went to read Waddington before I knew any genetics whatsoever. And uh, I realized that there are very, very important questions in, uh, in, in, in biology that have theoretical and philosophical aspects. So I got very excited about it and I knew that in order to be a philosopher or a writer or whatever I wanted to be, I have to know something about the world. And to know something about the world for me at that age, which was 17, was to know some kind of facts about the world, like science. So after some hesitation, I chose to study biology. And then I went uh, to study in uh, London University for one year in Berkwick College. And my teacher of genetics was Marian Lamb. And she introduced me really to genetics because I was excited about Waddington and because I sort of realized that not everybody who was thinking about evolution knew about Waddington. I asked her very early on, I think in, after two lessons, do you know Waddington? And she smiled and she said, you'd better learn to, to to, to walk before you start running. And, you know, I ended up doing a PhD in genetics. And she was a superb teacher, so I learned a lot of genetics from her. And I loved genetics. I loved the elegance of it. I liked the clarity that it gave. I also uh, taught genetics. I taught a, a genetics course in Tel Aviv University for several good for five or six years, I don't remember how many years. For example, I taught the Mendelian genetics. We looked at the first law of Mendelian genetics, uh, the law of segregation. So there are two aspects to this law. The, the one is that the maternal and the paternal uh, determinants or whatever it is that uh, the elements separate. And the second is that the developmental history of, uh, uh, of the parents does not influence uh, this, uh, the expression of these elements in the offspring. These were the two assumptions. Without these assumptions, you cannot have, Mendel couldn't discover his laws. So we said, okay, these are the assumptions, let's look at these assumptions. When are they violated? Are they violated? Because we knew what I read with them, we read Mendel's original paper. We knew he chose his traits very, very carefully indeed. He was very clever about it. And he chose them carefully in order to show the generality, a kind of overall generality. But the question was, does it always work in this way? I just posed the question and we analyzed it and we looked at all kinds of experiments. And I was aware of when I taught Mendelian genetics, I always I, I taught my students to think very carefully about all the assumptions that go into it and test for these assumptions because they're very important. And they did. And I think they enjoyed it. They enjoyed it. We, 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 all of us enjoyed I mean, we, we, it. Was a, it was a very demanding course, both for them and for me, but it was a lot of fun. And Marianne and I, she also admired uh, Mendel, we both admired him, and we read a lot about him, about the man and about, uh, about his work. And we went to Brno, to where he worked, and visited the monastery in the Mendel Center. We didn't have an appointment, we just came and knocked on the door, and uh, a very beautiful woman opened the door for us. This was Anna Matalova. And she was at the time the director of this institute. And she was very happy and very helpful. And we sat with her, I think, for something like three hours and talked because we wanted to learn from her also because she was a great scholar of Mendel. And she knew a lot about his work. She took us to the library. She showed us Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, that he read. The abbot that recruited Mendel, Abbot Knapp, he was very interested in heredity. And he posed to young Mendel the question, not only to him, but in general, he posed the question, and which Mendel picked up, what is inherited and how? And I remember when I read this, I sort of 
I laughed with sort of happiness. I said, yes, this is the question. What is inherited and how? And it's not just genetics that is inherited, the DNA sequence variations that are inherited. Many things can be inherited through different mechanisms. But this is the question, and this was the question that Mendel picked up and he tried to answer. And he answered in his own way, in a very, very, uh, doing some of the most important in, uh, experiments in the history of biology. He gave us the foundation for our thinking about heredity in a very, in a, in a very fundamental way, because, because his experiments were so good, his assumptions were so clear. I admired Mendel. I think that his paper is a model paper. If you want to teach the, how to do an experiment, what the experimental method is all about, you teach Mendel. I think it's very important to understand how he worked and what were the ideas that were prevalent at the time and how innovative he was also in his approach to the question of heredity. And also how he used the experimental method, how he used basically statistical kind of thinking, which was very unusual at the time. And also to understand that the laws that he discovered, the law of segregation, which is one of the most important regularities with, that we see in the, in the biological world, how, how it was discovered and what he had to also to discard, what, what had, how he had to, fo uh, to find the right kind of system and the right kind of traits in order to discover these laws. The, the, the assumption that he was making, for example, about the developmental history of the parents not influencing the patterns of expression of, uh, of what we, we now call genes, is not valid in many cases. It is sometimes valid and sometimes not. And that this is something that we have to understand and that we have to, re to take into consideration when we, are, uh, when we are thinking about heredity and doing experiments and trying to find out things about heredity. And also, uh, it has implications for evolution, of course. So I think we have to teach Mendel's work in a kind of historical context, in the broad sense, and also in an evolutionary context.